I just have to say a really funny, a funny story. We talked about um, Eva's rise to power yesterday at our management team meeting, and it was it was great because at the last meeting, Megan, you know, was like, Eva, you're in charge, and um, I I think that uh, the ELC was like, what? Yeah, but it was we didn't follow we didn't follow proper, proper procedure. But as it was brought up in our meeting yesterday, so glad we didn't, or we would still be in a space where we didn't have a chair. So sometimes you do have to, you know. Yeah, it's a coup. I you have, you have to be part of a coup. You have to rabble rouse. <laughs> I'll call it rabble rouse. You call it a coup um, to get what needs to happen done. So even though they were a little like feathers ruffled, it was the right feathers ruffled. So well, I'm glad you you gave that introduction because I was going to say that um, I, I I so I crashed the the uh, executive committee meeting. <laughs> It was awkward. <laughs> um, but, We're not rebellious at all. <laughs> but anyway, it worked out. Um, so I made it very clear that I think that the committee should um, be a place where, you, like, instead of leaving it to the other committees to say, oh, yeah, we applied the equity lens, that it needs to be brought to this committee, our expertise. Um, so... Um, I have asked that all the policies that the ELD and ELC would be charged with, and I even put this out to advocates at a different table the other day, like if you think that you are going to be doing some legislation, you should bring it to the Early Learning Council um, Equity and Inclusion Committee so that we can look at it before it has to go through the rulemaking process to make sure it had the equity lens applied. Not mm -hmm. just from your perspective, but from the committee's perspective. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, again, ruffling feathers. I think we have a uh, huge, it, 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 um, it's something that, that a, a few people have a hard time wrapping their minds, I guess, around that concept. Um, and I and I don't mean it to be any sort of like bad or good. It's, mm -hmm. it's just like oh, we have another thing that we have to do, and it's not uh, it, it it's not it, it I don't want to say it's a power struggle, but in a way it is. Um, it and it is what it is, and I think that if as a state, we're going to take the work of equity and inclusion seriously. We need to have to you say, if we're working on policies, it needs to have the equity and inclusion subcommittee look at, make sure that the equity lens is applied. Yes. <laughs> yes, this is that. Um, I think our biggest challenge, too, with that is Proving to people that it isn't about urban versus rural, or you know, uh, but what it is about is reaching the, the families and kids most in need. And sometimes that will be um, easier to to figure out than others. And sometimes it may look like one region is favored over another. but we're going to do our best to get the most kids what they need. I think originally when we put together um, the targets for the Early Learning Council, it was estimated to be about 40% of the kids in the state are could be considered at risk in some capacity because either socioeconomic status uh, race or ethnicity, or uh, use of a uh, DHS or self-sufficiency program. So, I, and I think that our equity lens does reflect that. So, I think that's what we should always keep in mind. So, I guess with that, we're going to start looking at the the charge, and then the the um, strategic plan, which is just a chunk of 
the strategic plan that applies to us. Sadie, can you hear me okay? I feel like... Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Hi. You can see the webinar. Okay. Oh, good. Hi, Patricia. Oh, somebody chatting us you? No, I'm, I've got, I'm talking to Patricia. It's okay. Okay, good. I'll monitor, so don't worry. Okay, good. Oh, thank you. you. Um, yeah, let me know. Is, is she hearing us okay? Or uh -huh. Okay, good. Patricia, you can speak up if you want. I didn't know she was having tech difficulties. Have we, I don't remember if I've met Patricia before. Okay. We could do room intro. Yeah, oh yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, Patricia, can, you, can you speak up so we can see if your sound is working? And give yourself an introduction too. Is she typing? Oh, trying to talk to her because we've been we've been texting back and forth on here, uh -huh. and her it shows that her sound is on and it's not muted, but I'm not hearing her, so she might need to dial in on the phone. Okay, she's working on it. Okay, cool. Okay, mm -hmm. well then I'll start. I'm Carol, I'm public affairs director, and co. Um, Co-staff lead for Equity Implementation Committee. Yeah. I'm Carmen Ellis, I'm training coordinator at Child Care Resource Referral in Multnomah County. Uh, Eva Ripito, uh, AFSCME staff, and then Early Learning Council member and uh, de facto chair of the ELC Equity Committee. Sadie, do you want to do an introduction? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sadie Feibel, Director of Early Childhood Programs for Latino Network. Good morning. Good morning. And then Patricia is on the line. All right. So just before, I guess before we get started, do you guys have any questions about or thoughts about having it, people bring us their policies before it becomes uh, or uh, legislative concepts or legislation before they get passed. Yeah, I think that's really important. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that's a good use for Okay. I'm make sure I wasn't having, I wasn't like taking on too much and that no. you know, we were right on track. Um, great. So I have up on the, the, uh, the early learning, does it make sense to look at the charge first or the strategic plan? All right. And Um, if we look at the strategic plan, I think it will help inform what we want the charge to be. Hey, how are you? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Miss Joyce just got here. Here's the, our charge and our, and our, it's a work session. Yeah. You guys want to work, work session, let's work. We do. <laughs> so Eva was just asking, and you can, help inform this, obviously. Um, do we want to go through the, the bigger strategic plan of the whole early learning system, or do we just want to start with our uh, equity charge? Hello, everyone. This is Patricia. Oh. I think I'm in already. Oh. Hello. Hi. Sorry, having difficulties so, with technology. Um, the question on the table is if we want to go through the early learning council. So if we want to go through the system, if we want to go through the strategic plan first, or right. if we want to go through our charge first as a, as a means of getting started? I think the strategic plan. All right. Yeah, to put, provide some context. Sure. Yeah. Um, so each uh, September, the Early Learning Council 
uh, has a retreat that we're coming up on that um, quickly. Um, and we go through, we created the strategic plan. Uh, the, the council was created in 2011. I think the strategic plan was created in 2014. I'm trying to remember where I was in, yes, 2014. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of updated it a little bit last year at our September retreat. So that's why it has a 2015 to 2020 strategic plan. Um, so the strategic plan is actually pretty big and it encompasses all the subcommittees. And um, in it we have uh, the goals of each and with the overarching goals of the council. Um, so, um, I guess I would like to hear, I, did everybody get a chance to look at this before? Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Do you have feedback on, do you think that all of this still makes sense? Does, is there something that we need to call out and really um, highlight for the council to look at in September for uh, during the retreat? Because you know, we'll be visiting this a little bit, although the, we'll be more focused on vision and making sure everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. But I think that in that, we, this is part of that, that vision is like making sure that we're clear about this, this, this piece of the strategic plan and how we fit into it or the council embraces it. Sorry, I'm having first aid jitters. That's okay. <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing really great. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so I think what we, I think if I can support you, yes. I think what we want to think about is if the strategic, if what we have in this equity council charge is reflected, if the strategic plan is reflected in that. So when yes. I look at the implement, uh, when I look at our charge for the folks in this room, it's a lot. Yeah, and it's yeah. not. And it's a lot, and we're not getting the support back to do this kind of work. Right. So how can we refine it in a way to take it back to ELC and say, this is what we actually want to be doing, and we need your support Thank you. to, to do that. And I had a conversation with Mayan uh, about this. That's what her and I were trying to meet before she left. Um, this, is, this is a large thing. Yeah. And um, we need to be working full time with the division in order to get all this done. Right, and even then, it's yeah. And I, I remember that you have said too that you know we need like by you know, get a focus so that we can get that done. And I think when I look at it, I'm like, holy cow, forest! Where are the trees that we need to mm -hmm. to really sustain so that the forest does live. <laughs> um, so, yeah, are there specific areas that we as a group should, yeah, I look at the as strategic plan priorities. I guess when I think of a priority, you think, okay, this is number one, this yeah. is number two, and there are some things that will be overarching that are always applied to those priorities, right? But like you said, it's a laundry list and they get overwhelmed. <laughs> so when I look at the bullet, advise the ELC, ELD on developing a consistent approach for listening to communities, incorporating feedback, vetting, resulting action, and ensuring perspectives from underserved communities are regularly heard. I mean, that's an easy one. Yeah. That's an easy one, I think, if we gave them advice based on our experiences, based on some of the things that they're doing. Yeah. That I could see we could, you know, we could do that. We could knock that out. 
Um, well, and I think we have uh, yeah. some groundwork laid through the, you know, what was done with Preschool Promise for community mm -hmm. outreach. Um, and at least on the, I mean, and, and given that, you know, we always make improvements and we know that we did by more people or figure out better ways. And the one above that, advising them on developing disaggregated data collection standards, mm -hmm. that seems like something that the council needs to already be doing. Right. And we should not have to, I mean, we can advise them of what we think, you know, they should be doing, but they should, they, there are people in the system who should be able to say, this is what we're doing. Are we missing anything? I'd like to know where they're at now. Right. And then, then be in a better position to say, have you thought about this? Or, you know, it would be useful to have X, Y, and Z. So mm -hmm. to me, it's like yeah. some, some of these things, it's hard to say whether or not we should be doing them or focusing on them without knowing what's currently happening. Yeah. I would agree with that. I mean, the data. It's a pretty big one, but we don't have any, we don't have a full picture of what it is already happening. Right. The thing that I would say if you're doing, if you wanted to have to use that charge, would be to look at what is being asked to be measured here and ask whether we have a data system in place that can actually measure those things, because there are things in here that I can tell you that we don't have to collect the data okay. as a state to measure. Okay. So some of the things, there's at least one or two things in here I'm like, hey, you actually, we actually don't have the data to measure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the that question so, is, what are we asking to measure in the first yeah, place? Yeah, what are we asking to measure and do we have a system in place to measure those things yeah. so that this is even, these mm -hmm. will can actually be measured. Right. But, you know, I think as a committee, I have, <laughs> to dive in pretty deep to understand where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. Not to say that we shouldn't do that. But. Right, but just where are we at? We might find out that what's set up now is a good starting point. Right? Yeah. And once those things are in place, are they additional? So for me, it's like what is currently in place, right. what's missing. Mm -hmm. um, so we might need a visit from our mm -hmm. our, our data our guy. Data, data, yeah. Yeah, I guess so in the strategic plan we have success matrix, but what does that look like, and you know, mm -hmm. like where are we with that? Um, and then how can we? Uh, you know, I guess then we apply the the eight questions. Well, I guess not all eight questions would apply to looking at the metrics. Maybe they would. Um, well, maybe the question becomes to Tom, George, who's our data guy, how are you using the questions to compile your work? Right. Mm -hmm. The eight questions in the equity. Uh, Patricia and Zadie, do you have any thoughts on the, the conversation thus far? Can you hear me? This is Patricia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, I agree with what the, the other person was saying. Uh, we need to make sure that we understand exactly what's being done in order to give our suggestions. I was reading at the strategic plan and um, um, all the different strategies being used by this, and I like it. The only part that I have a question in regards to equity is on um, Goal number two, stable and attached families. We are covering a lot about different strategies that we're doing to support the families. But in regards to the Hispanic community, um, stable and attached families could mean something like how do we support um, housing? And how do we support um, more economic opportunities through job development or through 
supporting like a program that we have in Adelante Mujeres to support equity is called the Small Business Development Program and we are supporting Latinos, specifically everyone, but specifically Latinos and, and uh, more in regards to Latino women to develop their own or to start their own business and, and have more economic opportunities to have more stable families. Uh, so the, the part that seems the most vague is this 4.1 advised ELC on ensuring implementation of the equity lens across the ELC work. That says to me we're supposed to look at every piece of work that everybody does. Yeah, and we're not doing that. No, not at all. And I think that's why I explicitly said at the um, the committee is a um, executive committee meeting the other day. Like, I have, I want this to be an expectation that the committee, you know, everybody knows that the, that the committee will look at anything that we need to do. Um, and I started with legislation just mm -hmm. because, you know, currently we, the division's trying very hard to get contracts out on preschool promise and it's the most apparent um, and there were a lot that and continue to be lots of debates around how the policy if it's equitable um, across the board um, so yeah and I mean if we did everything all like that the ELD does that's a huge amount of work so I think yeah I think it is good to Show them what you know, is it legislative and rulemaking that we want to look at, or do we want to go broader than that? Because those two items are pretty big in and of themselves. Yeah, what do you guys want to get specific on? Because this, I mean, first of all, this list is too broad. Second of all, it's kind of wibbly wobbly. It doesn't actually mean it could mean anything, and it could mean absolutely nothing, which right. is why you know. A little hamstrung. Um, oh, yes, exactly. Hamstrung, yes. <laughs> I'm using all my politically correct words. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, and maybe even you start as you are setting the tone. Like, what are the, what are like, if you had three things that the committee would do that would most affect children and families, what would what would your three be? I think we need, well, I think we need to have open, like, be inviting to um, other advocacy organizations, you know, so that they can come in and present their ideas. Of course, you know, they're going to have their own timeline for doing that, but they need to feel welcome and as this is part of their community engagement, too. Like, we're a stop on their, on their tour. Have and then we have expectations that their legislative concepts or uh, legislative drafts meet X number of criteria in the equity lens and that if they don't meet those, what's the timeline for doing so? Because, you know, I think we can set reasonable goals and, you know, like there are some things that are must from the get-go and then some things that we can say, oh, you can build on that because we know that that'll take some time. But what's, what's the, the process? So I guess being open, being a committee that everybody knows that they need to come see and talk about, and talk about their ideas with. Um, and then be a formal uh, committee that does look at legislation and the ELC's rulemaking. So it's kind of three, but mostly two. And of course, that's my very—that's the world I live in. So I couldn't completely. So Sadie, same question to you. If you had three things you'd want this committee to look at as part of our charge, what would they be? Um. Gosh, let's see. I think 
I think I agree with a lot of what um, has been surfaced already, and um, I I really really appreciate the um, the suggestion that that policy come before this committee prior to moving through the rest of the process, um, because I feel like that's where we're going to be able to make lasting and systemic change. Um, I I also, um, let's see, gosh, three top three things. Um, I mean, and maybe this is tied to policy, but I think something that's sort of been top of mind for me in terms of um, access to quality early learning for particularly for kids of color, um, I, I would really like our committee to take a a really deep look at the professional development and um, sort of the, the avenues for underrepresented uh, early childhood professionals to come into the field. So I don't know if that's, that's a piece of policy, but it's a right, that goes directly to you know policy that ELD wants to talk about this session and. Actually, David Mandel is going to come to the, our next meeting, but yes. Yeah. Patricia, do you have do you have some thoughts on what your two or three things are that you'd like this committee to focus on? You know, I was thinking the same team in regards to policy um, in professional development for professionals or for people working with early childhood education. Um, and communities of color. I will also like to see a lot more um, support for those uh, professionals that are monolingual, that don't speak Spanish as their first language or um, that speak another, um, I mean, sorry, that don't speak English as their first language, that speak another language and are providing services to those communities. It's really hard to find um, professional development opportunities for them. Looks like you have the Joyce, you have some feeling. Well, I think, you know, policy is definitely important. And access is the key one. Access across the board, access for kids, access for providers, and access for community. You know, are there ways that we can provide um, community-based organizations with access to support the passing issues? Um, I think about the safe community. I think about social organizations. There, I think there are a lot of different entities in different communities that can support early learning. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think we've done as good a job as we we need to to engage them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not on people's radar. So right. do, you, do you think that ties to Eva's number one, which is having the the advocacy groups and we can call community groups to come to our meetings, invite them to share what they're working on and how they connect to? Mm -hmm. I think that's 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 something. But I also think, to, for me, it's also outreach. Of outreach because we can't invite everybody into our right. meeting. So at some point, um, do we want to look at possibly doing some type of forum, some type of activity where we can bring people in? Or writing it right. into policy of one contract requirements that people reach out to if you yes. have a state contract that you're working with different yes. types of organizations and well, that's one of the questions on the equity yes. with, yeah. yeah is like how, did you do community engagement around this mm -hmm. yeah like looking at like who are people working with who are they partnering with who are they talking to who are they asking opinions of and incorporated I think those are important things there's a lot of extra in the community, communities know their community. Yeah. So I think sometimes they make the mistake of trying to tell people what they need as opposed to asking them what they need.
to what? give a thought. Okay. I think. Um, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I, going off, kind of, off of that, you know, some of our uh, communities in the state have said, you know, in um, our feed, I won't say which one specifically, but you know, when they were asked the the demographics of their area. They were like, uh, I don't know, or it's so small that it's hard to, you know, but how, I guess, how do we become a resource so that we're not shaming them for not knowing or not knowing, you know, how to um, reach the, 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 the statistically, I, I don't want, I hate to say statistically invalid, but. <laughs> You know, the, the smaller the, the percentages that are so small that they it, it it they get weeded out yeah you know, they co they consider it statistically insignificant insignificant and and, and you know how do you valid. do that how do you call people insignificant right when they right. exist mm -hmm. exactly so and you know, so how do we support you know those hubs and those communities to reach the Significant yet statistically insignificant <laughs> populations, so that they're you know, and feel comfortable to be prepared for them. Because mm -hmm. I think right now um, they're feeling shamed, and that's not what we want. We want them to feel supported and um, that they they know that they have resources available to them to help the families in their communities, no matter what the size is. So, sorry, that took me a while to get yeah. to that. But. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it kind of plays off of the community engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna, and that actually ties right into what I was thinking based on um, in reaction to city about um, like professional development and making sure that different groups of early learning providers have access to that professional development. Um, because I think that sometimes those less, those smaller statistics groups get, I mean, they often just get left behind. Okay. That's what we're all talking about. Right. But I think that we're at a place where we have to shift from meeting the needs of like the mainstream and then reaching those smaller groups as sort of an afterthought. We have to shift our thinking to just starting with those smaller groups. And right. I keep saying it, but we're not doing it. Right. Everyone is yeah. still taking on projects, doing them in English, and then figuring out afterward how, who to get to translate it or who to get to be an interpreter. How, how are we going to deliver this online thing to these people who don't have computers? Like, we need to just start with the people who don't have a professional, who don't have computers, who don't have access. And to me, that's what equity would be. Right. Start with the groups that most need it and then go backward from there. Right, which is just a big paradigm shift. But mm -hmm. I think that that's something, like that's kind of the work of a group like this, is when people bring policies to be like, okay, mm -hmm. let's just start analyzing your policy from the perspective of the people who most need really yes. advantage. Right. And, and to challenge people to do that with us, what? too, like to invite them to do that with us. Can I, can I add something to that? This is Patricia. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Um, I think that um, adding to that comment, we also need to make sure that we are providing um, those professional opportunities for family, for communities that most need it, um, but looking for culturally appropriate um, professional development opportunities. Yes. It's not about it's not about going and getting one of those trainings that we have provided for many years to, in English and trying to translate it into another language when so many times that information is not culturally appropriate. Right. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I, when I'm talking about personal development, I mean culturally responsive. Right. right. From the Hi, this is Sadie. Can I chime back in? I think I my call dropped. Oh, yes. Um, I, what I wanted to also add, and thank you, Patricia, for for your comment. Um, I absolutely agree, and I also, um, you know, there's also. I'd like us to look at the definitions of high quality uh, early childhood staff as well, 
um, because there is research that supports that having staff who reflect the, the young children that they serve is a strength and that children learn better. Um, and so I, I feel like ha um, often for um, early childhood providers or potential early childhood providers from communities of color, there are institutional and historic and current <laughs> uh, barriers to, to meeting the educational requirements um, that exist in order to be considered highly qualified. And so I would really like us to take a look at other definitions of highly qualified or other components that um, sort of stack up for, for a provider to be considered highly qualified. Yep. Which plays into that preschool comment. Yeah, right. as opposed to seeing people and being at a deficit. At a deficit. Yeah. Right. right. I think it's important, I agree with you, that like, we need to look at how we can support those <laughs> those professionals to reach that they already have strengths and to use those strengths and then to look at our expectations and how we might support mm -hmm. them in continuing to grow as opposed to being straight up. Yeah, yeah, I just wrote strength based. Yeah. yeah. And I also think there's precedent with this. I mean I feel like the, the term highly qualified teacher, highly qualified provider came around with No Child Left Behind. Yeah. And even with the implementation of ESSA, there has been a rethinking of what does it mean to be highly qualified. Mm -hmm. So I think there's also precedent to re-engage in that conversation that I think came about. You know. Do you want to do a quick introduction? Oh, on the phone. sorry. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Here's your wayward person, Lillian I'm Green. <laughs> I'm the equity director from the Early Learning Division. I'm sorry I'm late. I went to the movie building <laughs> and then had to come up here. <laughs> I was just on autopilot. <laughs> yeah, I love autopilot. <laughs> it, it leads me astray off then. Yeah, I was like, like there's a particular way that leads the girl to get here to go to the movie building. So. So I, I want to just, this first bullet, identifying and analyzing service disparities of the population by hub region. Has that been done? Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't think we have a full report from the hubs. I mean, because they all came online at various times. Mm -hmm. I think some might be a little bit ahead of it, but I think that's something that we could actually easily say this is an expectation that we have this done at least some sort of initial report by X date mm -hmm. um, and I think knowing that the scramble that they've been under with preschool commas or at least the five or six mm -hmm. that have been doing preschool commas I would say we can't ask them for this next month but they might have it too, but I don't know. It would be a reasonable timeline for getting a report on that. And I think also for um, within the hub, within their contract, there is particular deliverables related to equity, and they are asked to um, do demographic analysis um, by June 30th, 2017. Oh, so, um, so that could also be. Yeah. Do we get. Do they, they need to do demographics by June 30th? Yeah, demographic analysis. Can we ask them to also, um, or uh, or maybe say, if have them do an analysis of disparities, or would that come to us to? I mean, which would everybody prefer that we get the report and then say, we know that. But you want us to, like, do they give the report we identify the disparity? Right. Would that, I mean, I guess, the report is just demographics. It's not showing the programs, too, right? And who's, who's accessing the programs? Well, I mean, I, I, I know that that um, the liberal is still, still being, you know, um, crafted. So if there's particular areas that this committee would like to see, Included or you know that could be included in the conversation. I think that would be helpful. Like what? Yeah, what are we asking them to report to us, and how does how? I mean, I imagine 
that it has equity lens, but we, you know, if we're asking to look at all policies and legislative concepts or whatever, maybe, you know, that's something that we look at. What's the timeline for you doing the deliverables from the ELD? For the completion of the, or for the hub, for a hub for the completion, yeah. um, June 30th, 2017. Oh, so but for you guys to give the, what the hubs are expected to? Um, I think it's due out, um, Mid to end of September. Ah, so yeah. we have you have time to inform them. Yeah, so, oh, you we do have. See. Yeah, because um, the one of the the goals of this is to look at um, like demographic disproportionality across mm -hmm. multiple mm -hmm. sectors, and um, through the training that we conducted for the equity self assessment that they completed, um, there was this whole piece around um, disproportionality and how do you look at um, how do you see that in the lens of um, the likelihood of children accessing programs mm -hmm. compared to, you know, their population? So even if you have a smaller population of, like, children and children of color in your area, are they more or least likely to be able to access the services? Or what should we talk about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can we look at that the, the September, our September meeting? Or do we want to think about it before that? Because if they're yeah. due, they're due that. Yeah. Yeah, late September, then maybe we want to try to get that into that. Yeah. So if there's like particular things that we, because I know that's my lens around like really looking at the, because the demographic analysis, we get demographic information for all of our programs on a almost quarterly basis. So it's digging deeper than just like the basic demographic analysis of looking at the number of children. And I think it targets to like, you know, um, the access like the, the ratio of access for children in these particular areas um, compared to the population of children that meets the criteria for their program. How are they gathering the child-level data? It, it honestly, it depends on our programs because some programs, they currently, they may, um, if they are impacted by dollars um, from ELD and for, um, we have some demographic level data for student or children, but that may not be the that may not be the case for all programs. So again, it's a program by program basis, and I think that's going to be an uh, interesting conversation for hubs and looking at the scope of like the sheer number of programs in which they're supporting and you know um, aligning with in their um, catchment area. So we literally have like a, a board with all of our programs and listing the types of data that they currently collect because you know it would be hard to like add a different um, data element at this point in time if they haven't been collected yeah. already. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of like what do we have right now that they currently collect and as we're going into you know our next cycle of the next what are the particular things that we are asking them to collect. And this is cutting across all contracts uh, grantees. You're just looking at the calendar. Our next meeting is until September 20th. So if we were to look at that and advise it, would that, is that something that we would be allowed to give feedback on individually over email, or is that something that would be, because it has to be public. Mm -hmm. right. um, i trying to remember all the rules. Yeah, what can we do by email and what can we do? Or can we have Well, for, like, for, I'm, I'm wondering for this particular conversation, what are the particular needs? I mean, like, you know, what's the need for this committee? Mm -hmm. What do you need to get out of that? And how do we then build that into the process? Right. If that's the case. So, yeah, I think, you know, we were going through and trying to figure out, you know, filter the, the, um, the charge so that it makes sense, too, mm -hmm. and then, you know, broadly, I was saying that we, were, we should have the expectation that you know, our policies and legislative pieces come through the committee to make sure that the equity lens is in applied and not just have you know, the other subcommittees and such say, yep, we did that, check, mm -hmm. um, you know, because that's our expertise. So, um, you know, going through and looking at each of mm -hmm. the bullets, 
okay, so we have this first piece. I mean, so maybe just a, you know, at this point, we ask for a report on it, and maybe we, you know, because it'll be an ongoing thing with the hub. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, from this point on, we say, okay, what does, you know, what what were the deliverables that the division asked for, and how what's the report, and then you know how do we refine that process going forward to make sure that the equity lens has been applied and you know been at least brought forward to the this committee too. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of what we're trying to do is. It's a little bit going backwards because people have been charging through work without asking the yeah. equity committee anything, right. even though that's what they were supposed to do, but has not been empowered by the ELC. So how do we backtrack and then move forward having right. people include us moving forward? Right. So I right. guess that... Yeah. One for things that already happened and one for things that are coming. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. So how do we inform what the hubs are doing now? knowing that we're expecting them to be more inclusive moving forward, which is a tricky mm -hmm. question. Right. And tricky for how do we jump in there. Right. I and know. I think it's, it's, yeah, it's been as tricky as, like, we're actually a support, not a, a tearing down, but a lifting up. Because I think a lot of people might think that we're trying to Right. Insert something that did, you know, like just to make things complicated. Right. They will think that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure of it. <laughs> so does that refine any of this? Is that all that conversation? Is there thoughts of refinement you want? I think it. I think instead of identifying and analyze service disparities, if we maybe look at the deliverables that the hub are supposed to provide, make sure that it does include all the equity pieces, and then I, I, I guess do we give a response to the report? Is that something that we should do, is that, or is that going too far? I mean, it's just, I was going to say, I think we share our responses with the person in ELD who's responsible for that, you know, so that they can incorporate that feedback and share that feedback. Yeah. I, I, I'm a little hesitant for us to be kind of coming in and say, oh, didn't do this, you didn't do that. Um, we, we have to be a little careful, I think, about how we right. engage with We don't want to make people think we're scary. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, we, we should be like a thought partner for them to say, mm -hmm. you know, have you thought about this? Um, based on experiences that we've had, this is something that, you know, you, you need to take a look at and see how it would inform and strengthen the work that's being done. Right. Yeah. And I think it's real important to bring people in who can share the kind of information that we need in order to inform what our recommendations or advice might be. And that goes along with the making sure that we're not that we're being supportive, not shaming, and then getting yeah, getting the answers or getting to the answers that we actually. Need. You want to leave that one? I, well, I don't. I think identify and analyze service disparities. It almost seems too strong. Yeah. Like I, I like identify. Because almost it almost puts the onus of the identification and the analysis on the right. And committee. We don't, we don't want that. <laughs> I think we want to identify and. I think respond. Feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Analyze to me sounds real heavyweight. I mean, we can't do an analysis, a legitimate analysis, 
in a two-hour, once-a-month meeting. Right? <laughs> it sounds like it's kind of like, I can't agree with you, but I think the way that it's written kind of sounds like you're like going out and finding it yeah. as yes. opposed yes. to analyzing what's presented to us. Right. Which I think if we're just talking about analyzing Yes. Job, that makes sense. Yeah. But something yeah. like the way it's written, because it's yeah. not my core. Like, I believe mm -hmm. you have to get this out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, framing it in the really policy, and that, yeah, is really unreasonable. Would it be? So almost, it's like reviewing the yeah. disparities and providing, providing our feedback. Or, like, review and analyze service disparity report uh, for focus of population? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, I mean, like, I guess that like, makes it clear that the day, we're, someone's already done it in the work. We're just analyzing what's been provided to us. And I'm wondering, I guess, like for me, I always think about the, like the intention of like this particular one. Like, was this to get the state of affairs? Like, you know, is this like the moment to like you know have a, mm -hmm. a foundation around the state of affairs of what's happening? And this there there's Service disparities compared to their hotspots. I'm, I'm, I'm just. I'm okay. So I've got on that one. Well, I'll word smith it, and then mm -hmm. we'll pop that one back in. Um, the established metrics and monitor progress against measures of progress towards becoming a culturally responsive organization and policy body in nine domains. That oh, is the that is, that is the biggest chunk of. Yeah. You don't know. Right. I think, can we just point to the eight questions in the equity discipline, um, in, the, in the addendum, the eight questions, or the, or, you know, yeah. do our policies answer the eight questions listed in the equity list? And the eight, do we have it? And I'm 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 wondering who is this targeted towards? Like, is this uh, is this charge? Well, I, I yeah. who is well I know it's charged, but I mean, is was this is this directed towards the ELC? Because I mean, like, we know that the division itself has completed the self assessment and identified four of those nine domains. And I'm just wondering who's the right. I remember that that was like the first meeting that I was on, and I was. That's when I was just like, holy cow, this is a, like a 40 page document. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we need to share updates because, yeah. It says ELC. Hmm? It says ELC. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, says ELC's I mean, work. it says ELC's work, but it also says it advised the ELC on the following policy area. Uh -huh. So we're not. Yeah. He's still allowed to do it, but. So changing the ID and analyze services varies. We can do that. We can advise them on how the hubs are mm -hmm. addressing or not addressing disparities. But how can we do that for the rest of these bullets? Or do we want to do them for the rest of these bullets? Well, I don't. You know, each committee is you know, and each committee has their own metrics, right? Mm -hmm. And then. The ELC has their metric that's laid out in the strategic plan too. And then so I guess our question is, do each committee's metric and the early learning council metric have I don't know, I'm trying to simplify it and I'm just getting stuck. <laughs> I, cause I don't, I don't want it to become like this is so on it is like onerous because I think that's why people are scared too, and that's when when I say to the larger committee or various people on it that I have this expectation that we're going to be putting the you know bringing things before the equity committee and applying the equity lens. They think maybe not about all of these individually, but. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to do, 
find a way to do this without maybe making it feel so big and cumbersome or impossible. And I don't think any of these things are impossible. I mean, the thing that I heard you all say, is like that's carried through all of you all, when we were talking earlier, is everybody wants to influence policy and rules. We want to make sure before anybody mm -hmm. does anything that those foundations are in place. Um, right, and some of this, you know, we can say that those are goals that are in the policies, and I think that if we apply the lens and ask the eight questions, we'll get to these various sub-bullets, too. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm even wondering if, if, if this is, I mean, like to take on all nine, that, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a large thing. And I'm wondering if we, like, even just properly look at the, like, the um, ELC strategic plan, look at the nine particular domains, identify the nine domains, or, like, you know, the domains out of those nine that correspond with the strategic plan, and then shrink it down, then it won't be, you know, these nine areas, and even the division, we didn't take on all nine areas. We took on four. Which four were they? Um, do 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 do. Uh, we took on organizational commitment, leadership, and governance. We took on the racial equity policies and implementation. Um, we took on data metrics and continuous improvement, and we took on organizational climate, culture, and communication. That was in the. Um, your analysis? Sorry. Well, for the early learning division, those were the four domains that we took on. So we, I mean, um, each of those domains are like, you know, uh, substantive and to try to take them all on at once, you know, you know, it's, it's going to be as next to possible. Right. So I, on the, on the, um, the eight questions, is the objective by utilizing the equity lens, the OEIB aims to provide a common vocabulary and protocol for resource allocation and evaluation of strategic investment. The following questions will be considered for resource allocation and evaluating strategic investment. Who are the racial, ethnic, and underserved groups affected? What is the potential impact of the resource allocation and strategic investment to these groups? Two, does the decision being made ignore or worsen existing disparities or produce other unintended consequences? What is the impact on eliminating the opportunity gap? Two, how does the, three, how does the investment or resource allocation advance the 40-40-20 goal? Four, what are the barriers to more equitable outcomes? Is like uh, political, emotional, financial, so on. Five, how would you intentionally, or how have you intentionally involved stakeholders who are also members of the communities affected by the strategic investment or resource allocation? How do you validate your assessment in one, two, and three? Six, how will you modify or enhance your strategy to ensure each learner and community's individual and cultural needs are met? Seven, how are you collecting data on race, ethnicity, and native language? And eight, what is your commitment to C through 20 professional learning for equity? What resources are you allocating for training in cultural responsive instruction? So if we, could we, it doesn't make sense to just replace and we not. No, because I think that would fall into domains of racial equity policies and implementation practices, right? Yeah. So, and, and as Lillian was saying, like, we only took four on. I wonder if this group takes on the four, four, right? Because the four that is sort of I'm hearing are the racial equity policy and implementation, workforce composition and quality, community collaboration, and resource allocation and contracting practices. Those yeah. are things that are themes that you know, I've been hearing in here for three or four months now are the things that we've mm -hmm. been yeah. trying to focus on and tackle. And it corresponds with the, the, the last bullet. 
Right. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks for letting me walk through that. Yeah, of course. Carol, could you repeat that? Sure. So it's the racial equity policy and implementation practices, workforce composition and quality, community collaboration, and then resource allocation and contracting practice. That's funny. After you read through them the first time, and I went through and I checked, I was like organizational commitment, leadership, and governance. But we don't really have very much control over that. Right. So. Uh, Lillian, the ones that you cited, that's what I, that was organization, commitment, leadership, and governance. Mm -hmm. and um, racial equity, equity policies, policies and implementation practices, organizational climate, culture, and communication, mm -hmm. and then data metrics and continuous improvement. Okay. So it is a little bit admin. Mm -hmm. Council tag team on that, right? So as right. administrative staff, we are handling keeping that other stuff going. We can be the external. This group can be external pressure on. Yeah, the things we're not tackling internally. Not that we're not, but that are the current top four. Of it. No, I think that makes sense. Uh, I'm fully open to all the other interpretations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of a place to start. Same interpretation. Okay. Is there any other Patricia? Hello? Hi. This is Patricia. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the ones that I was um, looking at are racial equity policies and implementation practices, um, organizational climate, culture, and communication, community collaboration, and resource allocation and contracting practice. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about those? In the I like the internal, external. Sadie, is Sadie still on? Sadie, are you still on? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are. I'm sorry, sorry, I was it was um, cutting in and out a little bit. Can you just um, well, uh, do you have any particular thoughts on the like picking four that we should uh, focus on as a committee <coughs> in the okay. picking that. just four of them? Did you say pick four? Yeah, four of them. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um. I think definitely organizational commitment, leadership, and governance, uh, racial equity policies and implementation practices, um, workforce composition and quality, and um, service user voice and influence, I think are the mm -hmm. ones that are really important to me. Yeah, for access, I, I, that's, like, I see the importance of all of them. Right, of course. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, but I think if access is one of our biggest service user voice and influence, it should definitely be. But I don't know if that is tied with community collaboration. I think one thing. <laughs> But one thing with executing this on, in the division, there are so many cross points because I mean like with our culture responsive um, verbal and written communication, that means how are we getting materials out to the um, to our constituents, 
How are we receiving feedback? How are we utilizing that feedback? I'm mean, so like there's many crossovers, so you know. I think it's you were saying that you feel like it's different. The choice, the service user and voice is different than community collaboration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I think service user voice. We're talking about the the folks who receive services and how their voices are used. I mean, how how they are engaged mm -hmm. and um, what type of influence do they have? I mean, are they able to come and say, "This is not working for us. This is not working." Our community. I think community collaboration is basically what I was talking about earlier. Um, what collaborations are there with community-based organizations, with the faith-based community? So I see that as different because I'm seeing it more as how does this work engage and use the, the resources and the people in their community. Uh, that's why I see this is differently. To me, to me, I completely I completely agree with Ms. Harris. Thank you for saying it. Yeah. I think it's well yeah, I think it's communication and collaboration two pieces, like community and then individual. Because I see, and I guess... Uh, uh, explain, be more Yeah, clarified. so I guess with, when I'm thinking about it, it's, sure, yes, that we, we're, you know, I, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, but and I guess what I was thinking about it is, is there a feedback loop because there are going to be things that are state-funded that we do have more say-so, and then there might be things that are community partners that are completely nonprofit-based, right? And that isn't to say that we should ignore those things or not acknowledge them or work with them, but we don't have any sort of governance over them, right? So what we, you know, are we accessible? Are we checking in? Are we working as, you know, like, are we acknowledging that those things are happening? And then on the service user voice and influence, I guess, like, are we having town halls? Are we being responsive to those? Are they in conjunction with community partners? Because that could be, like, I'll just say, ask me the community partner. So when we do community outreach to providers and we access them through ask me's um, list and everything, that's service user, that's community partner, and they are there's a feedback that you know where we're getting information from providers who I would say are also huge advocates for the parents that they serve. Um, so I, 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 I was approaching it a little bit differently. Like yes, there program there are programs, community collaboration and programs, but I'm not Okay, so we're talking two different things. Right. Because I'm looking at service user and that whole notion of voice. Right. Is people who are directly impacted right. who are using the service. And I'm not talking about union. I'm not I'm talking about the actual people, a parent, right. a grandparent, and then the influence that they have. Right. Because often they don't have influence. No. They can be upset, but they don't have any way of doing that. So that, to me, is what service you use. To me, I right. see that it's very specific. Absolutely. No, I, now, I agree 100% on that. Okay, yes. now community <laughs> collaboration to me is very different too. Because to me, community collaboration means how do you use or how do you engage and provide outreach to those community-based entities who may not be using the services, but who may be able to provide something. For example, you have a faith community. And I know there are some faith, there are some churches that have, you know, child care programs. Mm -hmm. um, so how might they be engaged 
to add value to what is being provided to the state. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm th I'm thinking community in a more um, I don't see what word best describes. I'm, I'm talking about everyday people who need to be a part of this in some way. Right. Um, and they may not necessarily be an organization whose primary focus is on this, this particular scope of work. Yeah. No, and I, I, yes. I think I was getting at it in a different way because yeah, I yeah. so I see the I see the community groups as yes being stakeholders but also a conduit for getting the uh, the user voice and influence too. Mm -hmm. So I, that's why I was coupling them together so that it's it's both. So when you're looking at community collaboration, are you getting community collaboration where the program it is being considered in a way, you know, like do they provide these services and then who do they have when we talk to them, when we have a town hall or a forum or something, is are the people that are using their services there to you know have their the user voice is the community group is the conduit for the user voice. Because right now it's hard to find an individual, you know, just as you put a call out, can I get some people to respond to how the services are being, or do they have access, do they, it's usually done through a community group and that's why I was doing community collaboration and service user voice in the same group. So I guess um, I can sorry. sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Hi, sorry, this is Sadie again. Um, and I, I see that they can be very connected um, working for a community-based organization. Um, partnering with our organization is often a way to get service through their voice. So I see that logic and I would advocate for keeping them, calling them out separately because I, my concern is that <clears throat> um, often the service user voice will, will fall away because it is the hardest. It takes the most work, right. um, and so not not calling it out makes me um, feel uncomfortable. I guess in that, well, I believe that all of our intention is good. If we don't if we don't say it and commit to it explicitly, it may not happen. Okay, okay got it. No, I'm fine with that. Yeah. And there and there are different ways. See, the, the thing is, the way you're going to engage each one of those can be very different, you know, because we talk about why, the question is, why does the service use the voice fall off? What are we not doing right. to keep them engaged? Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of know some of the things that There's you have already to do. so many hoops to jump through. <laughs> right. right. But if people know that their voice is valued, mm -hmm. that they will be heard, and if they can see concrete examples of how something that they brought to the table actually gets addressed, and follows up on, mm -hmm. then you have a different sense of um, wanting to be engaged, wanting to be involved as a user. Yeah. Uh, I, d I just think it's two different, it, it can result in two different approaches. Yeah. And the outcomes in some cases may, may cross the line, you know, but so I, see I, yeah, I agree with Sadie that they need to be separate. I guess what I, what I was trying to get to is because I don't want us to pick one over the other, and if we're picking four, you know, maybe five. <laughs> five. Yeah, yeah, five. 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 I just wanted to say, is that something that we could just say communications and you know collaboration with communities and service users, so that you know it's like my preference not would be with Sadie to keep you know to focus on them both, and we can have five. Okay, we can have five. I just wanna, yeah. Because I think there will there will be alignment with some of the the approaches, some of the things that we will do. So I have a, a little slide note right here um, that fits in really well with this conversation about service user voice and influence. Um, I have talked with several people about this legislative process 
where we add serving on committees and board board positions and then like subcommittees of those uh, um, as a uh, adding that to the list of specific duties like jury duty that you would get be allowed to have time off. Like your employer doesn't have, have to pay you for that time off, but it would be protected time off. Um, I have approached the government. From your, from your math team? Yeah, no, it's not an app. Oh, okay. Um, this, is, this is Eva's idea to get more people involved. <laughs> <laughs> and feel like they can be involved. Like, this right. is, like we're saying, this is something that's valuable. This is something that's valuable. Employer, please allow employee to have this time off. And it is so valuable that we consider it on par with jury duty, legislative duty. You know, like if you're an elected, you have this protected time off. So why can't you know somebody who's appointed to a board or commission that the government entity um, have that protected time off too? Because I think some of the problem is is if we will we approach parents and individuals who are in positions like ours where we're expected to do something like this, um, they feel intimidated, they don't feel like they can ask for the time off. Um, and so I think that if they, if we were to say your voice matters, that we need to back it up in legislation. I guess the only problem I see with that is the unpaid time. Right. Many of the people who we might really want to be at the table can't afford to take the time off. I, yes. And that's, that's the problem with it. I hear you. I was already thinking about the employer argument of what you want me to pay them to do this too. It, well, yes, ideally. And so maybe we do start with like it's a paid day off. But if, if, if having to give them the choice of like, oh, I'm out of my paid days, but I still want to go to this meeting, they can do it. Um, so yeah, and I, I so I've talked to a few legislators. They're interested in it too. But we would have to get as this body, we would need the governor's sign off on it because we're we're a committee that serves it. Right. But, see, but see, this becomes an equity issue. Right. You know, Absolutely. an issue of access. And if we're, I mean, it would be great to have people to be able to do that. But the reality is we're already talking about populations of, of, of families and community people who can't afford it. Oh, absolutely. You know, we can do this because it's part of our jobs and all of that, but um, a lot of people don't have the kind of jobs where they can do that. And, I, you know, I, I would feel really uncomfortable sitting in a meeting, and there's two moms sitting here, and I'm knowing that they're not getting paid. No, I agree. I would much prefer that they have paid time off. I, <laughs> as Eva and as no, Eva I understand. <laughs> but I, I guess the thing is, if you're going to ask for something, it needs to be the ask. The ask should, should be, be equitable. equitable, right? I'm all for it. I just, I was always starting from the place of like, uh, people aren't going to go for this. But uh, is there a way that um, there could be a stipend included to? to compensate them for their service. I mean, it's public service. Mm -hmm. Some boards and commissions do receive a, a, a stipend. Um, Early Learning Council is not one of those. We do get mileage reimbursements. I know that there have been um, some uh, committees and subcommittees where um, they have they, being the ELD staff, have made arrangements when, um, like for example, I know that in one case, a child care provider needed to have a substitute and mileage paid, and they, they arranged for that. So, so could we make a case for a parent who would need, I mean, it, it, to me there's a similar kind of case, really, that they need a right. special accommodation in order to participate um, yeah. and wouldn't have to apply to all members because those of us who are doing this on our paid time don't need to get paid twice, but for someone who really would be giving up their, either their paid time or they would be giving up their caregiving time, whether it's for their own children or others, 
those are the folks we want at the table. Right. Yeah, I but I think that's like I think that's a detail that could be discussed in policies. I mean, just across the board for uh, you know putting protected, making serving on a on a, a a government appointed board commission committee council as civic duty that's protected would go a long way in saying your voice is, as a service user is valued. And then we can get into the details of how people get paid. Um, but I, I agree, yes, as an equity thing, it, it is important. Is there, how, how many boards and commissions are paid and how many are not? So I assume that all of them got to say. No, no. No. <laughs> Wrong assumption. <laughs> totally wrong. Clearly. I, that, yeah, and there are so many boards and commissions, and a, there are only very few that get a stipend. And I believe, I don't even think, I, I don't, I can't even answer it. Yet. That'd be interesting information. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. I know a lot of them have self-chosen not to take the siphon anymore, as opposed to having their budget cut, whatever that budget is, which is always very small. Right. Mm -hmm. But I ask that because I wonder if the, um, a more interesting place to start is having all of the commissions, boards and commissions be siphoned position. That way it's an easier argument to then say, please right. come, because if we had to go the route of, no, of a free day off, even though, even if it was about pay, at least you know you would have yeah. a stipend for that time. Yeah. So, but if they're hardly getting paid anymore, then yeah. I mean, I think alcohol, uh, the, the alcohol and tobacco gets paid a lot. The medical <laughs> board gets paid a lot. What? The financial advisory board, I think. Really? Paid. I mean, oh, by a lot, I mean. Yeah, like they get. Oh, they get some. One hundred and fifty bucks a meeting or two hundred. I mean, I was on the. Like I was on, well, and I was on the. Yeah, because I was on the commission of Black Affairs, and we got thirty dollars a meeting. Wow. Right. So I was already like, how am I only getting thirty dollars a meeting? And the dental board is getting like. Some board oversees. That's an equity issue in itself, right? It is. It is. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I know. Everyone's just like, wow. So, yeah, so that's, that's what I brought up because there's like the disparity in that space. Sure it is. Then how do we, you know. And it's like, wow, so all the professionals that make money get paid. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me, uh, <laughs> Ben Stiller and Janine Garofalo did a self-help book like back in the 90s. And it was like growing money was one of the chapters. And you like just put it, like if you have a dollar, you just put it in a jar and it's going to grow more money. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. I know you wanted organizational commitment, leadership, and governance. Lillian mentioned that that is one of the top four um, for the early learning division team. Okay. Uh, and since her and I are here all the time, we will <laughs> let you know if that feels like it's not happening. Um, okay. Yeah, and it sounds good to me. Okay. I and I do like the internal external approach, and I think that what we just landed on too is something that we do have influence over mm -hmm. versus I think if we were to try to influence the organizational climate and organizational commitment, that would be a harder stretch for us. I mean we can do the ELC bit, but right. mm -hmm. okay, so to be clear, I'm sorry. Are we the
those are the five bullets that we're keeping a bullet. Mm -hmm. Are we also keeping the first bullet and that's going to analyze your disparities? I think we're changing that to... I've got it. Oh, yeah. Review. Yeah. That one's being yeah. modified. Then we're keeping the second bullet, but we're reducing the number of... Um, domain. 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 Okay. And then on the advise the ELC, right. um, we're actually... I said uh, get... I think that's so something get that we'll get our data guy to come visit and yeah, and then re revisit that point to figure out because right now we need to know where we are and how we as a city help tailor the questions to ask. Because right now they're in the okay. process of developing their data governance mm -hmm. board, and I think that would be a great group to have present and then also yeah. have in that okay. conversation around what's the the fields in which they're asking and yeah. what, what's the game plan around. Advise the ELD and develop consistent approach for listening. So we and we so we that last one we we said that that happened. Or that the culture responsive communication community engagement. I mean that happens at the staff level. I mean that happens in, in our administrative role. Yeah. This last one oh, okay. seems like it ties directly to what. Um, Ms. Right. Joyce and Sadie right. were saying, which all of us are saying, yeah. which is right. how are we better integrated yeah. with the ELC meeting and how are we getting community voices mm -hmm. heard at that meeting? And so we sure. can leave it on to more. I'd like to keep this one. Yes, yeah, definitely. I would really like to keep this one. Yeah, and maybe, yeah. The wishes are command. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think we should have it, like, part of that is. You know, I know we ha we submit our reports, and that's usually done through consent agenda. Mm -hmm. But I think that maybe we have the expectation where we highlight something, and maybe have somebody from the committee always present, even if it's by video um, or telephone, or you know, like we can record something and play it if that's impossible to get somebody. But like, have some sort of update and have it be on a regular basis. Like I think that submitting the written report, some people read it, some people don't, but I would like to have some sort of like visual audio or audio visual interaction. And what's the lobbying mechanism? I, I talked to Alyssa, who's the uh, council administrator, a little bit about this, but how do we get back off the consent agenda and into the actual agenda where that we have, you know, 15 or 20 minutes to have a conversation about what we've had a conversation about. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I, guess I, yeah, I think yeah. that putting it on the consent agenda just gives permission to ignore the work or assume that it's getting done mm -hmm. or it's just another checkbox in. Right. Um, so I think they can't, I'm happy to to advocate that we always have some time on the agenda, mm -hmm. um, but I would like to ask for other committee members to weigh in on that discussion with uh, Pam and um, Lindsay Cap. I guess is the person to to go to right mm -hmm. now. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. he's he's the person that staff are reporting. Oh yeah, that's an update too. Sorry. Yeah, I'm like. So currently, Megan, Megan's last day was August fourth, and um, there's not been an interim uh, okay. named interim ELD or early learning systems director named, and so all of staff are reporting to Lindsay Katz, um, but he has not taken on the duties of the director position because he has other duties already assigned. Oh, the Greek five oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, staff are charging ahead with all that they um, have been charged to work on um, before Megan has left and um, there is a search for a director. I get it with, and it, I, I was left unclear.
figure about whether or not an interim person would be appropriate. I mean the tape's recording, so yes, we are. That's an accurate assessment of what you of what you surmise. Yeah, because I think it was, it, yeah, it was interesting um, that we, some people thought that there was an interim that would be appointed and some people thought that that was not the case. So that's what I have to report on that. But the work at ELD continues. Yes. Mm -hmm. and that's the most important part. I think we have a good team to continue on with that work. So can we get back to the yeah. part to this little Absolutely. aside? Yeah. yeah. Um, we need to someone or some ones need to meet with Lindsay and yeah. Pam. And Pam yeah, I think Pam should hear from us too. And that needs um, to happen sooner than later. I would think. Yeah. The, I, I think I think everybody wants I try to find the right words again. I think it's important to say that this committee is like kind of been existing in a vacuum for too yeah. long. Oh, yeah. And it's there are many reasons why that did happen and has continued to happen and you know and I, I think we don't, I like, I think placing blame is not going to help, but just, just saying we need to. We need to start from here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're here. We're here. These are the things that we're looking at. And um, part of the strategic part of, plan. Part of part our of commitment is to make sure that we're able to provide some advice that will strengthen the work, move it forward. Right, and just set the expectation so everybody always knows that it's an expectation that you know when somebody when professional development subcommittee is looking at something that that is brought to the equity committee to say okay has this really has everything been thought of you know I think yeah. and just be a reminder because it's clear to me that without the consistent reminder. I think of Martha who has become the best advocate for her subcommittee and the budget that they've been working on. She is vigilant about reminding everybody mm -hmm. about her expectations and the committee's expectations. Um, and I think we just need to do the same. Um, does anybody have any other thoughts about should we, we've already gone over one of our first tasks that we did was the grant making and request for proposals. Do we want to review that again? Maybe do that for another time? Mm -hmm. Yes, because I think for this, yeah, I think this, uh, for this particular one, um, we have, uh, we have the RFP and then the repeat RFP process um, that we refer where we're working on and the work that we were looking at before was for the repeat RFP process, not the RFP process with two <laughs> different I, I I know, I know. I know it sounds weird. So yeah, we may have to so maybe bring that we up. come back on that piece of the charge on another day before and we'll want to do that probably before legislative session because I'm sure legislative session will create more RFPs for us to look at. Maybe like probably. Yeah. This will be my first legislative session. Anybody else have any questions? What things that we should look at for September? David's coming in September to talk about professional, this professional development team that we, we've mentioned a few times. And so now we can have some instant action. David will come and talk about the, the legislative um, work that we are introducing around. 
uh, professional development. So that's mm -hmm. on the September 20th. Yeah, so that's on the, the docket for September 20. And then for October, he's coming back again, this time with um, the committee, and I'm failing to remember the name of the committee. Not Best Beginning. Oh, man. It's the, brand, it's the newest one. Measuring success. Yeah. Whew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> with measuring success, because they want to make sure they're aligning with equity. They're brand new as they're starting their work, that which means, is a great that precedent to start. Well, with yeah, we would still fit into our five priorities. But yes, establish metrics and monitor progress. Mm -hmm. so. Who, who's part of that committee? Measuring success is uh, David Mandel, um, Canero, and then folks from the community, okay. volunteers. So it's a, it's a subcommittee of ELC. It's brand new. I think it's two or three months old that they've been building um, members. Great. Maybe it's so important to have that equity lens over how they're measuring success for yeah. kiddos. Maybe we have a list of who's on it, and then um, so then can we also do, I know that David was doing professional development in September, mm -hmm. and I know that there were a few other uh, legislative concepts that the ELC put mm -hmm. forward. Would it make sense to bring those in October? Do you want them to do all of the, every, all things legislative that are coming up in September? Yeah. And let, let them have Okay. And then maybe um, we could also ask, because I know Children's Institute is working on some stuff, and then we'll have um, not like Dana or someone. Like me. Yeah. And then we'll also have uh, potential fixes to preschool products. Mm -hmm. So September is all legislative action. So we'll do yeah. ELD legislative stuff. We'll invite Dana if she wants to talk about what they want to propose for um, this coming session, and then preschool products. PP fix. So then October measuring success. Should we ask for an overview of all the committees? Is that too much? There's like eight of them. I thought that's too much. Yeah. yeah. Measuring success is probably going to be a really good, yeah. robust conversation. Okay. We can also uh, go back to finish this part, the review yeah. of grant making and request for proposals. Yeah. And so we can yeah. do an hour of measuring success and an hour of finishing up our show. Yeah. All right. That's what I'm here for. Anybody else have anything? Yes. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. So we've been talking about more intimate spaces. I know, Ms. Joyce, you've offered your conference room before. Eva's also offered Ask Me Space as well, just to get out of these county slash state buildings and just have a little cozier space, maybe have some treats. So um, <laughs> who doesn't like treats? Um, and so I don't know who, want, who wants to take September, who wants to take October, but you both have generously offered your spaces. So. Where is your space? Uh, 60th and Burnside. Oh, yeah. I'm in the Yeah, the big green building. Yeah, we get a brighter shade of green now. And you have parking, no. and they have we have the parking, yeah, free parking, free parking. Yeah, because yeah, parking around here is hard. <laughs> yeah, we have parking too. It's um, not free though. Ah. We have um, yeah. objectives and smart park. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. it's not that bad. No, yeah, the smart park is like five bucks in the morning. So who wants to have September? Who wants to have October? You guys want to? The point or check your check your calendars. I'll check the calendar. You guys should let me know, and then that way I can make sure we get all the information out. Okay. So, um, so we're 
definitely on for some money. I'm good. Yeah, I'm, I'm good for all of them. Wait to hear. Five hundred fifty. 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 Okay, I'll check my calendar okay. work, and then we'll and see what's available. We, we have a board on that. And then next, I think next step is trying to encourage the rest of our fellow uh, EIC people to come. I'm hoping maybe now that it's getting meatier, we can focus on the meat of the work. We can get uh, Charles and Cody and um, Richard and Irving. They're not on this committee though. Charles, Charles, will you come? Yes. Feel free to, you know, tell him that I can see him. That <laughs> we miss seeing him here. No, you tell him. I do <laughs> tell him every time. <laughs> um, back one day, I even say, not to guilt you, but here comes some guilt. <laughs> and I'm wondering how to message because I mean, I am, I'm so happy. I'm, I'm like. This conversation, I love the conversation that we had in the space, and I'm wondering how to message the shifting conversations that we're having now um, to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been I've, I've been taking the notes and sending them out after we do the meetings, and mm -hmm. so I'm happy for the next round to say we're getting into the meeting, meeting work, and we would really appreciate your support and consideration as we move through this. I'm also Alyssa put together the rules of how, what your attendance is supposed to be for yeah. committee, yeah. Yeah. so I will attach that as well. But that was my question. It's like you have people on these advisory committees, but if they don't show up, they're useless mm -hmm. to to the work. And, and you know, and a lot of times you, you become. Sometimes you agree to do something, and then you find out that it's just not possible because of your you know other. And so the thing to do is to step off. Right, and that's okay too. Just let us know and yeah. we can fill your time. Yeah. I mean, we, maybe yeah. we get, uh, I don't know, do you think it would help for uh, those of us who show up to like divide up the list and we call people to invite them to come or figure out some way of, like how to make it work? Well, maybe maybe we should try to. Let's see, this is. But I'm thinking maybe some type of communication go out to everybody, just saying, you know, we are moving into a very active phase of our work, and we need to. We're just checking in to see if you're still um, available to serve on this advisory committee, because the the importance of the work really requires all. That, something to that effect. Right. And just basically have people say, you know, I can do it or I can't do it. Right. And, you know, sometimes people will say, <clears throat> I can't do it by being at the meeting every time, but I can come every other meeting right. or I can be on the phone. I mean, we just need to have people engaged. Right. right. And I think part of the frustration was for some of the members was that They didn't see the, the work being taken seriously, uh, that it was, you know, yeah, we have this, uh, this committee and it's just there to fill uh, uh, you know, the say that it's being done. Um, and I think hearing from all of us that, no, we're really, we're really moving this and we really need you to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also, like, September kickoff, I mean, we're in like the weird summer months, so you yeah. have the transition of the summer months, summer vacation, and now, you know, it's September, y'all. <laughs> well, I think the other thing is having somebody to come and make a presentation and talk about the legislative work, you know, so work, that might motivate some folks to be here. Yeah. It's really interesting to people. And you know, even maybe I can just craft the message and send it to you, and you can send it to them as the the almost the almost chair, the soon to be chair, post September vote. Yeah, the chair in waiting. 
chair meeting. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, what did I, I said? Uh, the facto the decision. Chair. Chair. So that decision will come from the council. Yeah. So, okay. okay. They'll make, they're going to make it in September, which is good. Okay. So how about... How, so you can that. send it out yeah. as the newly selected chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That way it feels... You know, they feel from the like care. Carol sent it, delete. <laughs> you say presumptive. Yes, presumptive is great. Although you presumptive in front of your name, it just conjures up such ease. <laughs> <laughs> I think presumptive. Uh. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, friends on the phone, do you guys have any final thoughts before we um, call the meeting, before Eva calls the meeting? Yeah. No, I don't have anything to add. It sounds sounds like we're getting re-engaged and re-energized, and that's a positive thing. So thanks, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for calling in. And Patricia, you also, thank you so much for calling in and getting on the GoToMeeting. Yes. Yeah. And who's looking forward to it? So I guess, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you in September. We'll have a robust discussion about all things legislative Ooh. coming through yeah. ELD for legislature and ELD. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you, Teresa, for coming yeah. down here today.